Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, family. My name is Karen. I'm an alcoholic. It is such an honor and privilege to be here with you tonight. Uh, Every time I get in front of a a, a room, I I get so nervous. I never got nervous in my addiction, but I certainly get nervous standing in front of you. Isn't that sweet, weird? Um, My sobriety date is September 6, 1989. My home group is Tawako, which, for those of you who don't know, is part of Montville. My sponsor's name is Doris. She has the nerve to move to Florida. (laughs) It's sponsor land, you know, that's where they all go. <laughs> and I miss her terribly, but you know what? I have a fabulous network of men and women in my life, and um, I've, uh, because of this program, made myself accountable for who I am, what I am, and what I do today. So Chris contacted me a while ago and said, hey, how would you like to, uh, you know, come up and share about um, recovering your spirit? And I'm like, oh, man, I love that topic. I absolutely love that topic, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, and it's directly related to working steps eight and nine, like out of the book, the way we're taught to run them, that I have a life that is absolutely extraordinary. I had no idea when I came to you that my life could be extraordinary, that I could possibly get through a day, a moment, a week, a minute without wanting to drink or another substance (laughs) or another addiction. I didn't know that this power greater than me, that if I just turned my will and my life and my ideas and my plans over, that I could have everything I possibly dreamed of, that I could walk one among many, and that I could have relationships that are extraordinary. did not know that existed for a person like me. You know, part of... uh, Steps one through three taught me about, you know, getting right with my higher power. And then four, five, six, and seven was all about getting right with me. But eight and nine is what set me free. And it set me free in a way that I have a hard time putting words to it other than to say it's grace. Other than to tell you that my experience in eight and nine is nothing that I would have thought of because the outcome was beyond anything I could think up. So in our book, it takes us back on page, if you want to go along a little bit, on page 76, it starts talking to us about we need more action, and we subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was taught that, I was kind of like, are you kidding me? (laughs) How am I going to do that? Thank God this comes after 6 and 7, when you have done some changes in your life, and uh, you have a little bit of the tools of acceptance. And judgment maybe have taken a back seat or you realize that that jealousy that you picked up wasn't really working or envy and sloth was getting into a whole barrel of trouble. When I started to see the impact of that in my relationships, I have to tell you I was a little bit humbled. (laughs) In fact, I was way humbled to the point where I don't even know what to say or do here. And uh, my sponsor was very wise because if you were like me, When I went to make those lists and I'm looking at those harms done and I was totally aware of quite a bit that was going on, I didn't know if I was going to be able to find that courage to face you about me. I don't know if I could say, you know what, I don't know how to tell you I'm really sorry for what I did and how do I make it right. Those words were very difficult to like come out of my heart. But what my sponsor helped me to do And this is where sponsorship is so vital. And she helped me to identify those things I needed to make amends for and the things I didn't think I need to make amends for. That was also on there. (laughs) Because there were situations that I thought, well, you know, I'm quite justified holding on to that. And she had me make this list called Never in My Planet on My Lifetime list just so those people would get someplace so I would acknowledge a little defiant, you know, a little acknowledge that there was a problem with me. And that problem in the relationship always sits with me. 
So I had to find out how I was going to make things right. And where was I going to be willing to do that? So as I went through this list and made this identification for myself of the things that I could do, my family definitely was not first. My family was crazy, you know, and I felt very justified in maintaining the anger and the resentment and the harms done, you know, because they deserved it. So it took me a long time, and I was probably about eight years sober before I was willing to really do this work. I mean, I did what I could because I firmly believe you go with what you know. You know, and delusion kept me really stuck in not understanding the power of the harms done in my life and the power of how they kept me trapped from being the person I needed to be. So the practice of six and seven made way for me to be able to bring steps eight and nine into everyday living. And that practice was, you know, don't do what you want to do, do what you don't want to do. The stuff I used to go, oh, you really want me to do that, you know, and showing up and participating. But there's a line in step eight that tells us that our, 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 our real purpose is to be of maximum service to God and to other people. I was of maximum service to self. And the switch, turning that switch, was change. And thank God it's progress, not perfection. Thank God we learned about things like act as if. You know, when I was going to be bumping into something that I knew I had to deal with, it was like, oh, my God. And my sponsors say things like, talk about the weather. (laughs) Seriously. Um, And and I I have some stories that I'd like to share with regard to that. So I did that process, though. I really did. Early on, I had that list, and I'd carry that around, and I had my, all right, I'll make amends, and then sort of, kind of, you know, when it's painful enough. You know what I'm saying? Because that's where I was at for a while. And my life was falling apart. I was sober. I was doing everything I needed to do. I was an active member of my group. I was doing everything you can do, but I was really holding on to the... I don't know how to do this. And the fear that gripped me that I would have to go to certain people and say, you know, I'm really sorry for what I did. You know, because they said don't use the word sorry because you use that too many times. I really apologize for what I did in my active addiction. What could I do to make it right? It was the what I can do to make it right question that I was going to lead with and hear back. I didn't know if I could do that. So in here it tells us just pray for the willingness and courage until you can't. It gives you that. It says, pray for the willingness and courage until you can. And so that's kind of like what happened. I was very willing to go to who I was going to. And my sponsor had me um, do the index card thing, you know. And we identified him, and we wrote out a script. And I'd call her up and then say, okay, I'm ready to talk to so-and-so. And she'd say, what are you going to say? And I'd repeat my script line, and she would say, no way. You are still too arrogant. Or, that's really grandiose. Or, that's really cocky. Or, something like that. Until I could get right size. So, having her in my life to, A, tell me that I was holding myself responsible for things I shouldn't. And that I had forgotten things that I should. And that there was a method and a way in which I needed to learn how to present myself to people I had done harm to. And in this process, I discovered a really incredible thing that the people I resented, the people that I hurt, were the people that I was afraid of. So it was this big, huge, gigantic catch-22. So, you know, we would back up. We would go back and look at the fear, and we'd go back and look at the resentment, and we'd go back and tear it apart and told the story on each one until I could find that spot that I knew exactly what I needed to do. And no matter what you said to me, I knew I needed to do that. And so those amends began to happen, and um, I I had to travel. She was one who believed in face-to-face, one-on-one, no letter writing, no emails, no texting. It doesn't, I didn't didn't have texting when I did my first, they do now, but um, no emails, no letters. If at all possible, it's one-on-one, face-to-face. So one of these amends had to do with my mom. My mom had died, and my uh, aunts had been interfering with me and how I took care of my mother, who was sick. And uh, when she died, um, it was a very painful situation. I had, uh, I was five years recovery, and I had been taking care of her for an awful long time, and it, it, it was, I couldn't do anything more. My mom was uh, an addict who, who had also suffered several strokes, and she was defiant 
and no matter what I did, wasn't ever good enough. And uh, she was ill, and she was in Morrisview Nursing Home, and um, we were trying to find her some assisted living. Because my husband at the time would not allow her to come home with me. So I, I was trying to find a place for her to be, because she couldn't be any alone anymore. And in this process, she hooks up with this friend that she had met in a bar. Okay, now my mom, when she was out and about, and we had already taken away her car because the Persephone Police Department had called me way too many times, and she'd been arrested for drunk driving. And here she is. She is like a, um, a phasiatic from her strokes. She doesn't really know where she's at, and she's just behaving like this. And uh, so, anyway, $10,000, $20,000 later, she hooks up. She finds this lady in a bar who she convinced to get her out of the uh, nursing home. <laughs> so she gets her out of the nursing home, and they leave, and they don't come back. I was livid. I was like, I don't know. And she forged my name because I was a caretaker. Oh, it's like a nonsense. And so I can't find her. And uh, it turns out she's at this woman. Her name's Joyce. She's at her house, and she dies of a heart attack. And our last words were, she's yelling at me that I'm not doing it good enough. And I don't know about you people in here, but good enough was one of the reasons I wasn't good enough was one of the reasons I drank. I was never good enough. And that just hit me, and so I decided I was going to talk to her. The night I was supposed to pick her up from this lady's house, she died of a heart attack. And, um, and then her sisters come in and said, if you have an open casket, we're not paying for the funeral. And I'm going, Pfft. We'll pay for the funeral. It's my mother. So we didn't let her pay. And then there was a fight at the funeral home because I had an open casket because I needed to see her. And uh, then they leave because they're mad at me. And, and, I mean, I was not very nice. Long story short, I was not very nice. And so my sponsor made it perfectly clear that I owed my aunts an amends. And this went for, like, years. I was like, there's no way I'm talking to them. And I did owe them an amends. I was far from what you'd call sober behavior, you know. So uh, I, they lived in Detroit, and when my mom died, she was cremated, and she wanted to be buried with her parents. And um, I'm telling the story for a purpose. I really am. And she wanted, to be, <laughs> she wanted to be buried with her parents. Well, she's from Detroit, and so that happened, and then they uh, said, okay, we'll send her ashes out to us, and uh, we'll have a memorial service like at Thanksgiving. This was October 30th, 1993. And we'll have it at Thanksgiving. Great. Well, I send the ashes out, and they bury her on her own. And they didn't have any of us here. And I'm from a family. I have seven kids. And none of us were there because they wanted a private ceremony. I was livid. So uh, we straighten this out, though, because in this, when I'm mad at you, there's something about me. And that was this discovery I was discovering. I'm mad at you. There's always something about me. And so we uncovered the list of things that I really needed to go see my I won't say the nasty word I was thinking, uh, ants, you know, the adjective. <laughs> and I drive out there, and I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to do it. So I sit down, and I face them, and I have my card, and I'm reviewing my card, and I'm talking to my sponsor on the phone before I go in. And she said to me, and what are you going to do if they don't like it? And I said, I don't know, but I'm really okay with this because I really do know I did really insult them. And I wasn't a very loving niece, and I wasn't very nice. So I need to take care of that. So I go and take that, and my aunt turns around, and she looks at me, and she said, well, it's about time you realize what a, you are. I was like, now, i got to tell you something. In normal behavior, that would have, like, just been the, you know, the fuel to act out. And i got to tell you, I was like, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And then I was able to go to my mom's grave. And then one of the reasons they wanted her out there is because we don't take care of her, and the whole grave was all covered up with weeds. And we could barely find it, and it was um, on the ground, and my kids and I were, like, grown. And we found it, and we cleaned it all up, and I was able to sit at my mom's graveside and, and read her her card. And i got to tell you something. I walked away from there free. I walked away there knowing I did the best job I could do with what I had. And you know what? As time goes on, that's how I look at this. I thought, you know what? I did do the best job I could do with what I had. And I realized that my alcoholism and my addiction, I had a strain of personality traits that were not very nice. And they caused a lot of rift between a lot of people. So it set you free. So another one I needed to make was to my dad. And uh, this was a very powerful experience for me. My dad had uh, walked out in the family and married my mom's best friend. And my, my mom had this stroke. Okay, goes and has this new family out back out in Wisconsin. 
I grew up in Wisconsin. That's where most of my family lives. So he moves back there and they, make it, and they pretend we don't exist. So my mom's dead. They pretend don't exist. So I have an opportunity now. My oldest daughter is, is accepted into school and she's going to go to school in Milwaukee where my dad lives. I'm like, God has a sense of humor. I hadn't spoken to him in close to 20 years because I was livid. But i got to tell you something. Deep in my heart, I needed a relationship with my father. And I needed to have him in my life. And I didn't know how to go about it because I was so mad at what he did. So angry. But I needed to make things right because my purpose is to be of service to God and to other people. And I couldn't walk around with that kind of stuff. So I'm out there and my daughter's going to school and she went to Marquette. And I don't know if any of you have been to Milwaukee, but i got to tell you, there's like a bar by every window as you go around the campus. And, you know, I didn't do anything I was supposed to do. My, I, I didn't connect with AA, and I didn't call the people I was supposed to call. I said I did, but I didn't. And, you know, because I just didn't do that. And I'm standing on the campus, and I'm looking at the bar, and I'm feeling lonely, and I'm feeling angry, and I'm feeling frustrated. And I was there by myself, and my daughter's being really self-centered. You know how they are when they go to college. She's being totally self-centered, and... Um, that's how I took it. That's what she was just doing her own thing, you know. <laughs> I tell that because that was judgment. She was just doing her own thing. And I couldn't deal with that. It wasn't about me, you know. Well, this problem was, it was all about me. So my, uh, my stepmother walks up behind me just as I'm thinking, you know, I think I'd go get a drink. No one would know. I've been sober for about six years now. No, who would know? No one knows me here. That's the thinking that's going on in the brain, you know. And they're not kidding. If you don't do this work, that's what will happen. And my a stepmother, she taps me on the shoulder and she said, hey, I thought you might need some moral support. Well, they were on my never in this planet in my lifetime list, those two. And I started to really think about my behavior towards them. Was I loving? Was I kind? Was I generous? Was I giving? Was I tolerant? I was none of that. Did I do things to evoke suspicion, bitterness, and jealousy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did I run with a revengeful spirit? Yes, I did. All of that. All of it. And so uh, we spent the next four days talking. We talked about what happened. We talked about what it was like for me and what it was like for them. And I just now, today, I, I bless my stepmother with, with the fact that she has my father <laughs> to take care of. But the bottom line is, is to set it right. You know, it's all about this whole process of setting things right and what can I do to make it better. And, my, and for him, all he did was want to hear from me. You know, um, not too long after that, my son got really, really sick. And when I was in the recovery room, uh, my dad was there. And we had a kidney transplant. I was the donor, long story short. And I'm like, what the heck is he doing here? That was my first reaction. It's like, why are you here? You're never here. And he, tears streaming down his face, and he's sitting there, and he's telling me, I am so sorry. But the year before is when I went to him. I don't know if he would have ever showed up, but he did. And that's the whole purpose of it. So it's, it's, it's the question comes about how do you approach these people? We don't know, and that's why you take it up. You take it up to your sponsor. You take it up to your God. You take it up to people who've been there, done that. you got a question about how am I going to make this right? And every time I've done this, every time I've taken a step forward into making something right, my life has gotten bigger. My experience has gotten broader. My opportunities are there because in my alcoholic thinking, I have taken a world and shrunk it because it's all about me and it's all about my thinking and what I think I need and what I think I want, what I know. The problem is, is that most of what I know is based on what fears I've got. And then this process of alcoholics Anonymous has given me this opportunity is that now my world is so big that I don't know. I'm not in charge of the outcome. I'm just in charge of the action. And that came out of this process of eight and nine, that I'm in charge of every action I put out there. I'm responsible for how I meet you, how I greet you. Those four absolutes that I've learned about, you know, is what I'm about to say to you honest. Is it loving? Is what I'm about to say or do, how's it going to affect you? If what I'm about to say or do it's going to, like, trip you up because I at least like to do that to people. I better not say it. If I can't be accountable for what I'm doing and saying, then I'm just going to create the drama that my life was before. 
And I'm not going to break out of that alcoholic behavior. So this realistic approach of making these amends and sending them on paper and going through with the sponsor and having an identification, I'm demonstrating to you, to my God, that I'm willing to go to any length because it says in our book, any lengths will go to any lengths for victory over alcoholism. And it'll set you free. And they're not kidding. It sets you free. It has set you free in a way that is beyond anything I could imagine. And uh, people who know me know that I have a very vivid imagination. And I can color things very nicely, you know, and, and being a master at manipulation, which I learned I did, <laughs> I could make things just turn out just the way I wanted. And I didn't know that that's not what you were supposed to do. I didn't know that's how we ran our life, that everyone has equal rights. So this whole new idea of how is that going to affect the other person really came about with this practice. You know, really came about with this practice of wanting and needing and desiring to make things right. So for, it's, it's, it's amazing. The, um, the book also talks about harmony and disharmony. I want to live in harmony with the world around me. I just didn't know how. I had trouble telling you I didn't know how. Because that was letting go of a tool that, you know, did me well. It was part of my armor. And this dropping my armor to be exactly who I am, exactly what you see, was not an easy process for a person like me. As we went, walked forward, and I'm telling you, I'm eight, nine years sober, and I did what I could, and then I got stuck. I got really stuck in hanging on to a relationship that was incredibly toxic because I wanted it to work. And it was based in a belief that I had to stay married to this guy because that's what I come from. And I couldn't leave the relationship comfortably. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. I didn't know what to do with it. It was like to death do us part and all that stuff. And I had no idea that that belief system really went back to religious training I had when I was a kid. If you had told me that, I would have denied it. I would have said that's not true. And um, I had this really wonderful person come into my life who really helped me work through that because I was willing. When you are willing to work on what's wrong, the people come. They show up. They come out of nowhere. Have you ever noticed that? You'll hear it in a meeting. You'll see it, you'll, you'll, you'll see it anywhere. And it's not just in the rooms of AA. It's everywhere. It might be at my job. And when my son was really sick and I was not doing well with that, um, there, he, there he, he was went to Morris Catholic, and one of the priests there was our family friend, and he would come by, and he would help him with the studies, and he was basically, I kept saying God sent him for me, because he helped me be right with that. He kept saying, this is not about you, this is about the people that are going to come into your life, and the people who are going to be affected, and who you're going to, he kept saying it wasn't about me, and I needed to hear that, I guess, so I wouldn't go into where I would normally go with something like, oh, woe is me, <laughs> kind of thing. Oh, look at my life, you know. So uh, he kept me out of that. And um, we start talking about this. And he said, you don't understand. God does not want you in that kind of pain. And we started to uncover a belief system. Because a lot of what I thought was real was really based in fear. So it took me time to unravel what is true for me, my truth, and what your truth imposed on me became my truth. So it took me a while. And uh, he helped me to unravel that with me until I was okay. Because I'll tell you what, when you're not doing the right thing and you're in recovery and you're trying to get through these steps and you're trying to face and do and get to the amends, I had such a delusion about harms done in certain areas in my life until I had this understanding that I wasn't responsible for that. When I let that go the world started to change, and I could have the courage to have a voice in a very abusive situation. I finally had the courage to have the voice because I knew now the outcome is not up to me. What is up to me is the actions I take, and they had to be guided. I needed to be guided. I really needed to be supervised, and Step 8 talks about that a lot. I needed to be supervised. Because how I would look at something wrong would be you were under judgment and criticism, and I had to lose that, and that took a while for me not to judge or criticize you in order for me to get forward in this. 
So um, it was an extraordinary experience that I could finally understand that I could be free of that. And I didn't do anything to deserve it. So it takes a while, and it takes a lot of talking and thinking it through. Um, in the step eight process, the other, the other thing that really helped me, and I don't know if it's written anywhere more than anything else, was that I needed to write out the situation and the story. And writing is very therapeutic for me because there's something crazy that happens and that I don't lie when I write. So when you're writing down something, you end up like telling the truth. And then I'd go back and I'd share it. And, and uh, we, my sponsors, I would write and I would share, would identify the character defects that were still raging. So back up. We had to work on them in order that they were, I was free of them in order to face that situation. So one thing at a time, slowly, ever so slowly, I was able to hold my head up high. I met that lady, Joyce, not too long ago the woman who um, my mom was with when she died, and I hated this woman. I know you're not supposed to hate anybody, but I really did. She was just a thorn in my side. They did things like forge my signature on checks and turn over accounts, and it was just like craziness. And they're alcoholic, and so am I. So you can imagine what was going on there. And I saw her in Pathmark, and you know how you see somebody and you kind of like walk the other way, or you pretend you don't notice? Or, you know, you walk on the other aisle. Well, I was able finally to go up to her because I understood for me what that meant. And just say, hey, you know what? I'm really apologized for my behavior when you were with my mom. Thank you for taking care of her and being her friend. I had no right to interfere with that. She needed a friend. And uh, is there anything I can do to make it right? And she sure let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Okay. I probably I deserved every word she said too, you know, I really did. But I was ready to do that. And that's what this is about too. You have to be ready to do this. I mean, I did the early ones as quickly as possible, you know, like talking to my kids and, and immediate people on and the best I could. But you know, and, and five years went by since I made that amends to my audit, oldest daughter and a Christmas came around and it was Christmas Eve and she just started at me about this and that and this and that and I'm listening to her and I said, Err. Let me ask you a question. Am I that person today? And she said, no. And I said, well, then I think this is on you. You can say that. I can say, and I heard, I think it was Sister Maurice say it, I already paid that electric bill. I already owned up to that. And part of what had happened in, in what, what happened in my experience until as my sponsorship was phenomenal, set, helped set me right, is that I don't grovel anymore. Yes, those are the things I did, and I never would have done the things I had done had I not been drinking and drugging. I don't think I would have done them. You know, some of those very subtle behaviors in recovery had to be addressed, but these specific things had a lot to do with active alcohol drinking. And uh, I looked right at her, and I was able to say that, and that, I'm like, that is amazing that I have a voice that I can say, you know what, that was true then, it's not true today. Never would have done the things I'd done and not been drinking or drugging. A mantra, please take it, borrow it, rob and duplicate, whatever it is. It'll save you when someone's attacking a behavior. Because getting right with others is hard. They don't forget. People don't forget. My kids do not forget. They still remind me the kind of mother I was when I was drunk. And I have to go back and say, well, am I like that today? No. Okay. It's on you. And I learned to say that. I learned to say, okay, is there something I need to do differently? When I'm in a situation today, which 8 and 9 has also taught me, how do I continue to make that? And I realize that's step 10. But in today's world, I do need to look and say, is there something I did? Because I have a tendency to get, like, you know, zoned and forget about the sidelines. And that's inconsiderate. You know, this where was I frightened? Where was I inconsiderate? You know, dishonest was huge for me. And I, when I found that out in 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, because I lied by omission, if you didn't ask me the direct question, you know, I don't really have to answer you. And, and so I had a lot of that to take care of. Like, I knew, but you didn't ask, so I'm not going to tell. You know, and that behavior takes a while to change. I mean, it took a while for me to change. And I would do it by not then being accountable and not showing up. And you can do those little things right away, but that kind of stuff, it took me time. It took time, it took God, it took prayer, and it took willingness and courage to say, I don't want to be that person anymore. I have a sponsee that calls this the throw-up steps. 
she just really can't stand it, you know. And, uh, but every time we go through a really hard one, we go through a really hard making an amends, I'm not in charge of the outcome. I am in charge of my action. I am a little bit freer. And as I've gotten free, I have discovered the person I am is not the person I was. I've discovered that I have integrity. I discovered that I'm trustworthy. That's huge. I discovered that um, I say what I'm going to say and I do what I'm going to do. And I discovered that I'm kind and I'm compassionate and I can show up for you because I want to. And there's no other agenda. Before it wasn't like that. There was another agenda. There was always a payoff. And so part of my amends had to do with identifying what's the payoff. Why is that? Why do you keep that going, you know? Do you not want to be free? What's the payoff? How, how does the field do that? You know, I had a sponsor talk to me like that. She would say, how's that feel? How's that going for you? <laughs> Tell me how that's working. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh. You know, but um, she was absolutely right. So you, get, you start getting a little taste of the payoff of being able to answer a phone, whether it's a family member, a creditor, a friend. I can answer the phone. And as, you, as I broke away from those behaviors that kept me in my addictive behavior pre, during, and after I came into recovery, my life started to change dramatically. Fears ran me. Fears don't run me anymore. The fears were really unfounded. I didn't know that. I thought they were real. I thought this fear of never being able to make enough money was real. Well, now I come to find out that I'm supposed to be a good steward of God's money. And when I am, I have a lot of abundance. You know, it's like I realize that surrender you win is very much in place here. That I have to have my priorities in the right area before they're going to change for me. I have discovered that I have a sense of humor. Now, i got to tell you, this is pretty much fun because um, when I came to you, <laughs> one of the first things my soon-to-be sponsor said to me is like, oh, my God, you hug like an ironing board. And I was like, that is so mean. <sighs> what does that people do? <laughs> is that what you do here? And I, I, I was terrified. I was terrified of everything. And um, I didn't even know I had a sense of humor. I, I couldn't even laugh at things. And now, now it's like I'll, I'll think of something and it'll come in my head and I'll actually be able to say it out loud. <laughs> You know, because it's okay if you don't like it, and it's okay if you don't get it, and it's okay that I don't even get it. Do you know what I'm saying? It's okay to be me. And uh, without steps eight and nine, without the prior steps, and without my desire to keep moving through, seeking the God of my understanding to make my life a bit, little bit better every day, I'd be stuck. I'd be stuck. I'm not perfect at this. I just know that I've experienced enough um, joy and enough success in trying it that I keep on trying it. There are days I feel like a complete failure, you know, and I feel inadequate, and nothing's working my way, and I'll go, what the heck is that all about? Because I know that's something else. I know that today. You know, and then you bring the process up. I'll bring the problem up it's from one through seven, eight. Now start talking to my sponsor, and we get with whatever it is that's t- uncaged for the moment. You know, whatever defect is just like a rocking and rolling. And it's usually, it's usually something stupid that started the whole ball rolling. But you know how we are. We start that obsessive thinking and off we go. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that. That doesn't stop. You just have to be vigilant about that. And part of the vigilance is in this process. Because I cannot tell you what I've seen and what I've become and what I've been able to do as a result of having the desire to be free from alcohol. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle I can stand here without the desire to drink. I have the desire to flee once in a while. My, um, my MO used to be get in my car, drive to the Delaware Water Gap, <sighs> breathe, and then go home because I had forgotten how to like, behave. My uh, sponsees bought me a T-shirt that says 80 West on it. It's very funny. <laughs> i tell you. And if you don't surround yourself with people that can laugh and people that can hug and people that can love, you will make it. Because they're the ones that tell me what's going on and set me straight. And if you think you can't do it, you can do it. 
You can do anything you set your mind to doing because we do create our own reality. Step two tells me I create my own reality. If I believe that I can't do it, I won't do it. If I believe there's a possibility that I can, I will. And in that possibility, you move up and you let your higher power in and just say, okay, I'm not in charge of the outcome. And you kind of keep yourself out of the way. Oh, my God, watch out. You are just on such a roller coaster. It's phenomenal. You know, a year ago, almost to the day, I was able to buy a house. I lost everything. Everything was taken. Cars, houses, homes, everything. And I have a really unbelievable job. Another miracle. And we can stand up here and we can be who we are. And I cannot be afraid of the dark. Because guess what? I've entered the sunlight of the spirit by saying, okay, God, give me a hand. That's it. That's all I got. Open for questions. Okay, I was taught that I have a responsibility for what I do, and you can take it any way you want. I was taught that everybody has a right to be a jerk. And if I want to join them, I can, but I'm going to pay the consequence for doing that. And it's interesting, because when you give somebody the right to be a jerk, they move into the right to be. And guess what happens? you finally give yourself the permission to write to be. Once you give them the right to be whoever it is they need to be, you've given yourself the right to be. And the reason for eight and nine is imperative when you have those resentments, because they will kill you. They almost killed me. I was walking around in Alcoholics Anonymous with a huge secret as I was in this abusive relationship, and no one knew. I was 12 years sober. I ended up in the battered woman's shelter because I had a secret. And I wouldn't tell you. Okay, the secrets keep you sick. And the amends are necessary to be free. And there's a process to get there. And there's steps one through eight and nine. So take it like that. Thank you. Yes. It's really important for me that I keep very pointed, forefront of my mind, that my primary purpose is to be of service, maximum service. So what's interfering with me being of maximum service? I have so much fun. That stuff sounds hard. It's like all become part of my daily living. Because I approve that I'm an alcoholic today. And not just admit it and accept it. I approve. And it comes through this process. It's very important place. It's so subtle. It helps a lot. Okay, anyone have any more questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, because there's nothing grander than having a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody and walking away knowing the job is done. And those that I don't have a response from are not as complete. So, yes, Absolutely. But I will tell you this, and we can end with that, that I no longer suffer from that shame, guilt, and remorse that I came here with. This has a great deal to do with it. So I think with that, we're done. Good. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.